Alan Saldeón, eh, Ongietari Gostioi. Buenas tardes, señoras y señores. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the European Dialogues. Uh, this evening's event will be held in English, so we have live translation for those of you who are here. And a special welcome to those of us, uh, those who are joining us live via streaming. Tonight, we collectively debate and reflect on the pending Brexit and its effect on the European Union with our guests, Sejal Parmar and David Gardner. On behalf of the Governance Institute for Democratic Governance, the cultural capital of Europe, San Sebastian 2016, the San Telmo Museum, and Caja Laboral Laboral Cuta, we invite those of you here with us tonight in San Sebastian, as well as those of us watching live, to listen and to share your thoughts and questions. The European Dialogues is a project in its third year designed to promote reflection and debate concerning the European reality, as well as to connect people and thinkers so as to promote an active and participatory collective of EU citizens. The first half of tonight's program will be the speaker's interventions. The second half is, de is dedicated to promoting dialogue. For those watching online, you can post your questions by tagging us. Uh, our account is EU Dialogues. Uh, in your tweet or by simply using the hashtag EU Dialogues. To accompany the debate and to help us conceptualize the shared ideas throughout the event, we have with us tonight Angel Lopez de Luzuriaga, who will be drawing live on the screen projected behind our speakers, and thus providing us with a graphic recording of the debate tonight. The graphic recording, the pictures from tonight, video and podcast, as well as blogs, videos, podcasts from prior events, are all available uh, online, free, on our website, www.europeandialogues.eu. Now, the reason that we are here tonight is because on June 23rd, 2016, 51.9% of the United Kingdom electorate translating into about 17 million people, voted to leave the European Union. Why? It has been over three months, and yet Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union, the formal mechanism for leaving the EU, has yet to be invoked by the UK. To help us understand the current status of Brexit, we have with us tonight Sejal Parmar and David Gardner. Allow me to introduce our speakers. Sejal Parmar is assistant professor at the Department of Legal Studies and a core faculty member of the Center for Media, Data, and Society at the Central European University in Budapest. Her main field of expertise in research is international and European human rights law, particularly on freedom of expression. Before coming to CEU, Parmar worked as senior legal officer at Article 19. She is currently researching and writing a monograph entitled Freedom of Expression Under Pressure. She is an associate editor of the International Journal of Human Rights and represents CEU's Department of Legal Studies at the Association of Human Rights Institutes. Alongside her academic work, she regularly acts as an expert for intergovernmental organizations, including the Council of Europe and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and has been appointed to the Academic Advisory Board of the Community of Democracies. Also joining us tonight is David Gardner. David Gardner was born in Brussels, educated at St. John's College, Oxford, and he lives in Beirut, Lebanon. A dual Irish and UK citizen, Gardner is the International Affairs Editor at the Financial Times, which he joined in 1978. He has worked mainly as a foreign correspondent, writer on international affairs, and now columnist and analyst, reporting for more than 50 countries. His assignments have included Spain correspondent, Mexico and Central America correspondent, European Union correspondent, Middle East editor, South Asia bureau chief. He was the Financial Times chief leader, leader writer from 2006 until 2010. In 2003, he won the David Watt Political Journalism Prize for his writing on the Arab world. Uh, also long listed for the 2010 George Orwell Book Prize. He was shortlisted for the 2016 Orwell Journalism Prize. He was made a senior associate member of St. Anthony's College, Oxford in 2008. He's been a speaker at think tanks, universities, and conferences in Europe, the Middle East, US, and Asia. President of the Institute for Integrated Transitions, an independent global NGO based in Barcelona. 
devoted to enabling domestically led transitions in countries emerging from conflict or dictatorship. So both uh, providing us with quite an interesting context, David being a dual Irish and uh, British citizen, Sejal uh, uh, born and raised in Wales, each experience working inside and outside the European Union. So I think what we have a uh, vast experience and diverse backgrounds upon which to build a context for tonight's debate. So now I turn it over to you uh, to help us to understand why the majority of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union uh, earlier this year, what is the current status of Brexit, and what, mi what might this mean for the ongoing construction of the European Union? Thank you both. Well, thank you um, very much, Katerina. Can everybody hear me? Um, thank you very much, Katerina and European Dialogues, for um, inviting me here to your gorgeous city of um, San Sebastian uh, for this event. Um, it's a great privilege and honor uh, to be invited and also share this podium with um, uh, David Gardner. Um, Brexit means Brexit. This has become a familiar mantra since our still new Prime Minister said those words over the summer, since the um, EU referendum results on the 23rd of June. 23rd of June has been cast as Independence Day by the leaders of the Leave campaign. And from the supporters of the uh, Remain campaign, it's become the worst political decision since uh, 1945. From a legal perspective, it is certainly momentous, perhaps um, the most momentous decision for centuries. Um, one that was not predicted by financial markets or betting agencies, let alone um, academics. As Katrina said, I'm from Wales, and as a Welsh woman um, of non-European origin, educated in England and at Florence, um, where I studied EU law, and now living and working in Hungary, and li having lived in two other EU member states. And as an international human rights advocate and ac academic, it wouldn't surprise um, you to know that um, I'm a staunch Remainer. My personal reaction was, um, as it was for many, um, like me, uh, shock, horror, distress, disbelief, anger, many of the same um, uh, reactions as uh, people in grief have. Um, and it's a, it's a reaction that I'm sort of still kind of coming to terms with. Um, but I'm not going to dwell so much on the um, reasons or the arguments for the uh, Remain campaign, but rather focus on three things. The first is to briefly highlight what, are, what have been identified as some of the leading causes for the decision for Brexit through the EU referendum. Um, some of the immediate responses and impacts, particularly from a human rights perspective. Second, I'd like to highlight some of the legal implications, particularly um, uh, this um, mechanism of Article 50 of the um, uh, Treaty of the European Union. What does it mean? Um, and finally, um, briefly, to touch upon what I see as the policy priorities going forward. Um, in terms of the causes, first, um, the EU referendum was the result of a manifesto pledge by um, a Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, as a concession to the Eurosceptic wing of his party and a response to the growing popularity of UKIP, um, headed by um, Nigel Farage. Um, some of these causes for the result have been identified as such. Um, first, the framing and projection um, of the Leave campaign was very much based on arguments um, couched in sort of rights terms, such as the right to self-government and the right to self-determination, and notions of freedom and liberty, um, shaking off the shackles of Brussels, the slogan of take back control and we want our country back became very much identified with the Leave campaign. On the other hand, the Remain campaign failed to come up with a similar slogan which um, stuck in the heads of the British people, although the, the, the slogan was apparently better together, um, but that wasn't convincing enough. Um, the arguments around the Leave campaign centered around issues of the economy and immigration. Um, but there was um, a great deal of misinformation in my view, um, a rejection of 
experts' um, uh, advice and um, calls to remain, experts from the uh, governor of the Bank of England to the head of the IMF to um, the president of the United States. There was also a general, and there is an ongoing general negative perception of EU institutions, um, which has um, been built up over many years through political rhetoric and a fear-mongering media, which certainly intensified in the months before the referendum. But Brexit as a manifestation of the discontentment with globalization is really part of broader regional and global trends in terms of the rise of populism, nationalism, exceptionalism, the crisis of liberal democracies here in Europe, but also elsewhere, and a kind of lashing out of people, um, a sort of a, a revolution. Um, in terms of the impacts, um, the financial me uh, markets saw the um, impact straight away with a sharp fall in the pound um, and a shock to the um, global market. And very recently, three months on, the Bank of England has highlighted that the UK now faces a challenging period of uncertainty and adjustment. Business confidence is at a four-year low, and there is fear that exiting the single market is going to threaten London's status as a hub by preventing UK banks from exercising their passport to operate outside the UK. In terms of politics, um, ironically, the process for negotiating the terms of the EU's exit from and reconfiguring its relationship with the EU is likely to dominate all other policy areas and government work for many years. Um, a colleague of David's at the Financial Times, Quinton Peel, has written that actually the EU um, uh, referendum result means more EU rather than less on the UK agenda. Internally, there has been institutional change in government with a new ministry for exiting the EU with 180 officials in London and 120 in Brussels. But in terms of actually giving indications at what, as to what Brexit means, there has been only vague um, comments by government regarding issues like the single market, migration controls, Europol, um, and when negotiations would start. The debate has been sort of largely focused on um, um, whether there's going to be so-called hard Brexit or soft Brexit, um, with uh, uh, the government indicating that the importance of migration control would trump um, any interest in staying within the uh, single market. Um, externally, EU leaders have indicated um, that um, the UK um, is not going to be able to cherry pick. Um, it's not going to be able to choose to stay in the single market um, and also um, uh, refuse um, uh, uh, free movement. In terms of human rights, there have been some serious concerns asserted not only by human rights um, organizations like um, uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, but also international authorities um, such as the UN um, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights himself. The EU referendum has encouraged those who thought um, the EU referendum was a vote to get rid of all immigrants and has become an excuse for an explosion of hatred within the country. Um, just in London, there has been a 50% increase in reported hate crimes and um, more generally in the country, 42%, um, um, just in, in terms of like the two, two weeks after the EU referendum. Um, in terms of the responses by government, this spike in racism, um, which has not only been directed at um, um, EU um, uh, citizens, not from the UK, but from elsewhere in the um, uh, EU, it's also been directed at people of other ethnicities, um, refugees, and those who are perceived as being not ethnically English um, or, or white. Um, the government has adopted a new action plan in relation to these hate crimes, um, but there has been um, a, a decrease in prosecutions compared to the same period last year for hate crimes, um, meaning that fewer incidents actually end up in court. In addition, and this is something that I find particularly concerning, um, there is a lack of um, politicians speaking out 
against such hatred. Um, the exceptions are Justin Welby, who is um, not a politician, but the Archbishop of Canterbury, who together with the Chief Rabbi and the London Mayor um, have um, talked about the importance of um, um, uh, you know, condemning these crimes, um, but also uh, responding to them in a positive way. In terms of rights, there is another concern that we have, which is the status of EU citizens currently living in the UK, and also UK citizens living in um, the rest of the EU. So there are 3.5 million EU citizens living in the UK. Um, and most people in the UK actually want them to stay. Um, there are 1.2 million um, British citizens living in the rest of the EU, like me. Um, among those, um, there are 32,000 non-British nationals in the UK who work in universities. And here we already see the impact of the result of the EU referendum. So the UK um, benefits from EU research grants. Um, it pays in about 5.4 billion euro, but receives 8.8. Um, recently, a German academic, academic body warned that UK universities risk losing up to 15% of their staff because European researchers and lecturers are leaving or rejecting um, UK higher education positions because of the fears of the consequences of Brexit. In addition, UK universities feel that they're being marginalised and increasingly thought of as being relevant. On the flip side, in terms of um, what will happen to UK citizens, that's also very uncertain. Um, but things are destined to change. Um, Post-Brexit, UK citizens stand to lose their rights as EU citizens. And these include the following. The right to free movement, including with family, within the territory of member states. The right to seek employment, work, and provide services. The right to non-discrimination. The right to equal pay. The right to receive health health care free at the point of use, the right to vote and stand as a candidate, um, to diplomatic protection and the rights under the EU Charter, which aren't the same as um, those under the European Convention on Human Rights. Turning now to the legal implications. Brexit is uncharted territory. No EU member state has actually left before. The EU referendum did not mean that on the 24th of June, the UK was automatically ejected from the European Union. The UK is still a member. Um, legislation giving effect to EU law still applies. Technically, the result is advisory or consultative, although there is a great debate about this and more broadly the steps that need to be taken before the UK can be um, uh, allowed to leave, so to speak. In order to leave, the UK must trigger the mechanism by which um, an EU member state can leave, which is Article 50, as was all already said. Um, there is nothing substantive about the conditions that Article 50 um, indicates. It's procedural. And there are a number of steps that need to be taken. Formally, the UK needs to notify the European Council of its intention to withdraw. Then the Council issues guidelines for negotiations. The Commission recommends to the Council of Ministers to open negotiations. Negotiations begin, and the Council asks the European Parliament for consent. The Council then uh, concludes an agreement by super-qualified majority voting. And um, the rest of the EU member states ratify any treaty changes that result as a, um, from the agreement, or the agreement itself does not have to be ratified by other EU member states. EU law only ceases to apply after the date of entry into force of the agreement itself, the withdrawal agreement, that is. Or, failing that, two years after the notification. Now, the UK government can come to an agreement with the European Council to extend that, but that is a huge gamble. Um, so, essentially, after... Article 50 is triggered, the UK has two years before um, it leaves. The result is the end of the application of the EU treaties and EU law. But um, national acts need to be adopted to implement or transpose EU law, um, uh, um, and that would remain valid if and until national authorities decide to repeal 
Um, any agreement could remove rights in EU treaties unless the UK specifically agreed to keep them under the new agreement. So rights such as free movement um, would have to be considered by, by the agreement itself. Um, in areas of exclusive competence, such as uh, trade, competition, monetary policy, fisheries, commercial policy, the UK would need to undertake um, substantial legislation. Um, EU law would, of course, remain valid in the rest of the EU. Um, in terms of judicial review, um, it's important to note that the withdrawal agreement is not primary EU law, um, but rather an international agreement, so could be subject to an annulment action before the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, who could also be asked to deliver an opinion on the compatibility um, of the agreement with EU law. So there is possibility for review at the European level. However, already there are a number of challenges um, to the government's argument, the government's position, that the UK can withdraw without parliamentary approval. So um, the government is arguing that it's, it's constitutionally impermissible for um, parliament to authorise um, uh, the um, uh, um, withdrawal of the um, UK from the EU. Um, that it's a matter of highest policy when the uh, procedure for um, exit should take place, and that is a matter for the government. Um, just two days ago, a High Court judge ruled on the basis of the principle of open justice that the government must disclose its legal arguments and also official documents concerning Article 50 procedure because there's been a great deal of secrecy about what its position is, um, even though court documents are ordinarily available. Um, but, uh, but there is a, a concerted group of um, citizens um, in the UK and um, also in, the, uh, in Europe um, called the People's Challenge, who are a crowdfunded group um, who have uh, managed to um, get the government to publish its full claim without um, being redacted or withheld. The full case is going to be heard on the 13th of October. So finally, in terms of priorities for policy, well, um, first and foremost, I think uh, political leaders at the highest level, including the Prime Minister, um, should, in the strongest terms, condemn any attacks um, uh, and racist um, um, hate speech and xenophobic political discourse um, in, the, in the UK, which the UN has certainly connected with the result of the EU referendum and the rhetoric that took place by the Leave campaign beforehand. Um, the future of EU nationals within the UK must be guaranteed and they must be um, allowed to feel at home. Many of these people have lived in the UK for many years, consider themselves, you know, to all intents and purposes, British. Um, the UK also needs to remember to implement its legal obligations um, with respect to other um, treaties, including the European Convention on Human Rights um, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, among others. Um, the referendum should not be seen as an excuse to abandon truthfulness, transparency, accountability through Parliament and open justice. Um, and I think it's also important, the, the EU referendum results and the post-mortem that's taking place um, about the, the deficiencies of the Leave campaign really show that there's a great need to rebuild public trust in um, institutions, um, including and especially European and global institutions, but also the values of liberalism and cosmopolitanism. Um, you know, I hate to sort of leave, leave my sort of initial um, comments on a, on a negative. So, um, just like to say that, you know, in terms of a long-term goal, um, given that there is a, kind of a great project for those who believe in in sort of internationalist principles and human rights and open society and liberal values, there is hope, I think, given that the UK demographically um, voted um, between the ages of, um, the UK population between the ages of 18 and 24 voted 75% to stay, to remain within the um, union. So, um, you know, with that generation, I think there is great hope, and that generation is also a lot more diverse. So, 
um, I think the, the EU referendum is, is just the beginning of a conversation um, that we're going to have about the relationship between the UK and um, the EU going into the future. Um, and there are many sort of challenges ahead um, in terms of what, what actually happened on the 23rd of June. So it's not a done and dusted deal, so to speak. Um, there's still hope yet. Thanks. this uh, uh, process, because that's what it is. It's definitely not an event, it's a process. Sorry, can you hear me okay? This is all right? Sorry. Um. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Um, it, it's, we are, I was going to say, in, in uncharted territory. This has never happened. Nothing like this really has happened before. So anybody who is selling uh, 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 a precise road map, not that many people on the Brexit side have even attempted to do that, their business is selling snake oil. Um, anybody who says they know what's happening next is probably lying like they were. Um, I mean, I will not attempt in any way to disguise the fact that I regard this outcome um, as an unmitigated catastrophe, frankly, and an act of political irresponsibility of the first order. That's not just because there was a referendum and the vote was lost. I don't really mean that. This, this. Uh, this started many, many years ago, um, and in particular, it, it took this uh, turn, a turn down this particular path six years ago when David Cameron and the people around him decided that it was much more important and to try and pacify the, the uh, Eurosceptic wing of the Tory party uh, than to, to you know, consider in the round the future of the nation, not to mention the continent. Um, so, you know, all that was subordinated to, to the considerations of a party and it's not in hindsight. Many of us, including me, wrote it at the time that when he took the first decisive step down this path, which was to withdraw the Conservative Party from the EPP grouping, the centre-right, pre predominantly Christian Democrat grouping in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, that there was only one destination that, that, that would eventually result, and that was the one that, that, that we have reached. Why? Because it's perfectly obvious that when you when you try and, and uh, uh, resolve a question like this with a diet of raw meat, then people come, the people concerned, they just come back for more and more and more. And every time he has made the concession and the capitulation which has led us to this point. And I think it is also the, 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 the gratuitous casual, supercilious way in which uh, uh, the people who were notionally in charge of the British government went about, and the political elite in general, went about this exercise is particularly shaming. Um, and, you know, I, I can't resist adding that some of the principal uh, uh, characters involved in this drama, obviously, you know, they were a clique of friends, old Etonians from a certain school, you know, who treated it very much, I think, as a game. That was certainly 
the position, I think, of Boris Johnson, who I don't think expected or wanted to win this vote. Um, he expected a narrow victory for Remain, but that he would be the hero of the hour to the uh, 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 Eurosceptic wing of the party, which basically dominates about 80% of the party on the ground, in, 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 certainly in England, um, and that he would be perfectly placed, therefore, to take over leadership of the party. As we now know, it didn't quite work that way. But in the meantime, what was unleashed on, on the country by this campaign of outright knowing and deliberate lies and this wave of populist demagoguery uh, which passed for argument under this uh, 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 mendacious slogan that taking back control of the country. Um, you know, the, what is the result? Well, I think it comes in two parts. I mean, this is a vote, in a sense, for recession, an absolutely unnecessary recession, an economic recession. And it's coming. You'll see. It's also a vote for secession, the eventual separation of Scotland. And it is a vote for the repartition of the island of Ireland. Uh, as, as Katerina pointed out, I'm a dual national, and the reason I'm a dual national is that I come from the other, my family comes from the other side of that border, which was in its essentials taken down by the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 and is now going to be re-erected as the hard external border with the EU of the so-called United Kingdom. All a totally gratuitous collateral damage of the ambition of a small group of old Etonians, frankly. Um, that, you might think, is, is, is enough, but it, it really it gets even worse, and, and uh, uh, Sejan has alluded to it. I mean, by stirring up these unresolved identity questions, what these people have done is that they have legitimised xenophobia they have made racism mainstream. It's okay now. Um, it's, it's entered the, 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 the mainstream discourse. And that obviously is not just true of the UK because there's lots of other collateral damage to go around. I said this is damaging not only to the United Kingdom, it's damaging to the European Union, to the nation and to the continent. It becomes okay in Europe too, in places like the former Visegrad countries, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria, which is about to rerun a presidential election and may it actually elect uh, the president of a party founded by former SS generals. Um, now, if I could remind you, 16 years ago in 2000, I think it was when the Freedom Party first entered <coughs> The, the, the Austrian government in coalition under Georg Haider, it was boycotted by the, uh, the, the Austrian government was shut out of certain organs of decision making of the European Union. It was not regarded as legitimate, but now it's regarded not only as legitimate, but almost normal. Um, what other things have been uh, uh, legitimized as a result of this, this mendacious exercise. Well, it is perfectly legitimate to use lies as a strategy, just as we see in uh, the United States with the Trump campaign, the so-called post-truth politics. Um, lies, you know, in the last century it was common, but, you know, it was regarded as something other. It was a product of fascism, a product of Stalinism or whatever, the, the strategy of the big lie. Now, it's just, just as many as you want, big, small, or somewhere in, in the middle. I mean, let me give you an example which I think possibly turned the result in, in Britain. 
It was, I think it was uh, the last but one Sunday before the actual vote when the Murdoch papers came out with statements saying that uh, 80 million Muslim Turks would be allowed into uh, uh, Britain. This is a lie on at least three counts. Um, first of all, the agreement between Turkey and the EU about uh, uh, essentially acting as a, a buffer, a holding pen for, for Syrian refugees against which they would get visa-free travel in theory, falls down at several levels. I mean, first of all, it's most unlikely that this agreement is deliverable. It's most unlikely because Turkey has made clear it will not change uh, its counter-terror legislation in order to get visa-free travel. And this cannot be fudged, it cannot be finessed, because the European Parliament has a veto on this. And they've made absolutely clear, no change on that, no visa-free travel. Number two, it is estimated that between six and eight million Turks have passports. Number three, it is known that the target universe for this visit visa-free travel. There's approximately one and a half million people. Why is that? Because those are the people they already work with to facilitate, as far as possible, uh, 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 ease of travel inside the, the, the uh, uh, European Union. And, of course, the fourth thing in relation to Britain, why it's a lie, Britain is, of course, not a member of the Schengen Agreement, with which this, which this deal covers. So, you know, Knowingly, somebody like Boris Johnson, the great grandson of a Turkish defense minister, an Ottoman Turk defense minister, who was proudly once referring to himself as a one-man melting pot, he goes with this series of lies about Turks, knowing full well that it is all complete and utter rubbish. Um, now, as I pointed out at the beginning, I do not pretend to be in any way objective about this. Uh, uh, I mean, it's much too serious for that. But I, I would add that part of the reason, I think, that uh, 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 this referendum had the outcome that it did, apart from the fact that you, know, you don't put something as complex as this to uh, uh, to a referendum. It's, it is not an adequately democratic means to resolve a question of this complexity, as, as, as I think we have just seen. But one of the problems, I think, was actually the way it was reported and covered and analysed by the BBC, um, which, you know, many of us decided to change the name of from British Broadcasting Corporation to bias of balance corporation because in their insistence that all these arguments were equal you give equal billing to both sides whatever they say and parity of broadcasting esteem to people who say the earth is flat is it no sorry it's not Okay, it's not. And, you know, it, you, it is your duty to actually point this out. Or to cancel debates. I mean, this, this is a particularly notorious aspect of this, this, uh, 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 this fixation with artificial balance. Okay. There clearly isn't any balance if 99.9% .9 of economists of any standing whatsoever say this is a very bad idea, and this is what is going to happen. And they can only find essentially one man in the country of an economist of sufficient standing, although considered by many to be a little bit, you know, uh, uh, eccentric, shall we say, Patrick Minford, okay? Now, he was the only man that they could find to talk as an economist for the Leave campaign. So what would happen is that, you know, there would be economists going lying around the block saying, and they would be actually booked and ready to go on air, and the programs would be cancelled 
because the one person that they could find, Minford, wasn't there. And that's their concept of balance. You know, the one flat earther. And, and you know, it, 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 it's, I think it speaks actually to a broader loss of nerve by, you know, a once proud public broadcasting corporation, which you see, you see it and you've long seen it on the European Union and, and it's, it's uh, uh, Britain's role or inside the EU, you see it on Israel-Palestine, you see it on climate change, where again, you sometimes have this artificial parity of broadcasting esteem, you know, despite the enormous weight of scientific evidence. Um, that is a kind of balance which I don't think does any justice to a democratic process. It distorts it. Anyway, it would appear that the lies continue. I mean, you, Boris Johnson, for example, is capable of saying last week in New York that the idea that um, Britain will be shut out of the single market if it restricts freedom of movement is, quote unquote, baloney. It isn't. It isn't. And I, don't, I think that tells us, I mean, virtually every significant figure inside the European Union, as well as its, its foremost constitutional lawyers, have pointed out that the four freedoms are essentially indivisible. Okay? Um, the fact that uh, 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 the present British government under Theresa May wants to keep silent about this is uh, that's not a strategy. Ambiguity is not a strategy. And nor can it mask the fact that Brexit, the Brexit camp, whatever they mean by Brexit means Brexit, they never had a strategy. They've never explained to us what it actually means. And they still don't know. Um, now, lots of people have pointed out that, you know, that the so-called so -called Project Fear, the Remain, uh, 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 campaign, well, all that doom and gloom and, you know, economic meltdown and, you know, it, it hasn't actually come to pass. That's a very limited debating point because actually nothing except the vote really has happened yet. Um, it's, it is true to say that, uh, uh, you know, UK assets have definitely, in a one-off, uh, al already been marked down by about 15%, which is to say, you know, British land, property, companies, bank deposits, government debt, all that is worth 15% less than it was before June 23rd. The currency is obviously worth less than that, and it therefore means that imports uh, which is between whatever, 30 to 40% of the economy, just got about 15% more expensive. Now, you can also point out that, um, as they do unceasingly, that the, the, the principal companies in the uh, FTSE index, the stock index, the FTSE uh, uh, 100, have gone up. Yeah, that's true. That's largely because the main companies in that index earn most of their revenue and profits outside the UK. Um, now, how long is that going to last? When you've got uh, a hard Brexit camp in the ascendant which says we not only need to leave the single market, we need to leave the customs union. Um, that, I don't entirely understand if they really understand what this means. I mean, to begin with, you know, that means that Every single uh, uh, trade agreement that Britain, the UK enjoys, uh, is party to as a result of its EU membership would have to be renegotiated from scratch. Um, you know, the complaint about uh, uh, the constant bleating about, you know, Brussels bureaucracy, well, believe me, you have seen nothing yet. I mean, I have a note here that it, it is what this would mean, particularly for small firms, is that for every good that they export, it would have to be declared on forms with 
50 boxes and 78 pages of guidance, okay? You know, they would be praying for Brussels bureaucracy when this starts. Um, what is this going to, what shape is this going to take? Um, again, I insist, who knows? They don't know, why should we know? But we do know what's out there. Uh, um, they haven't explained what it is that they want. But here, here is what is out there as, you know, in, in terms of alternative, non-full member state uh, 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 status. Here's what's out there. You've got Norway, the European economic area. I don't think that's going to happen because it implies free movement. Norway is, is part of the sing or most part of most of the single market, but uh, uh, it has to admit free movement. It has to contribute substantially to, to the EU budget without any say in, in shaping the laws. And it has one of the highest uh, per capita rate of uh, non-Norwegian EU citizens inside its frontiers. So that's Norway. What about the Swiss model? They talk a lot about the Swiss model. Um, neglecting to point out that the Swiss are about to be kicked out of the single market. Why? Because they can't or won't reverse uh, 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 the result of a referendum which restricts free movement of, of, of EU citizens. Um, and, you know, they already, I think it's roughly about a quarter of their population. So we're talking, uh, what I mean by this is we're talking about ratios of non-nationals far in excess of, 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 of what, what obtains in, in the UK, okay? And let me just point out, very importantly, uh, sort of mentioned it, it, that, that the Swiss do not have this unique uh, uh, passporting system for their banks inside uh, uh, the European Union. It's very interesting how they do it. They register where? in the UK, and they piggyback on the UK's rights, which are about to disappear. So that, that, that's, I don't think, going to be an ideal model either. Now, you know, we can go on down the list here, but just let me mention two more. It won't even have the rights of Turkey, okay? Turkey is inside the customs union. If Britain ends up outside, and the logic of its present position means that it will, if they are insistent, on no free movement, um, they will not even be inside the customs union and they will have this, this they will have to renegotiate uh, uh, trade deals around the world, which some of these, these Brexiteers purport to be, you know, this is Independence Day, it's a new liberation, it will set free this great trading nation. Okay, let, let's, let's cut to the reality now and the possible status would be equivalent to Canada. So what's Canada's position with the European Union? It has been negotiating uh, for seven years a trade deal with the European Union, which is still not there, okay? And when it is there, it will have to be ratified, not just by 28 member states, but 38 national and regional assemblies around the European Union three of which are already threatening to veto it, okay? Now, in these seven years, Canada had 300 trade negotiators working on this deal, okay? And it's still not there. The man in charge of European policy, another old Etonian, Oliver Letwin, was asked after the vote, how many trade negotiators do we have, Minister? And he just looked and blinked and said, none, zero, none. Not one trade negotiator. But it's all going to go extremely well, you see. I mean, there'll be 53 uh, uh, simultaneous trade treaties negotiated by this, this vast cadre of, 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 of Rolls-Royce negotiators. I mean, it, it is a joke. It really is a joke. The only, in fact, bear in mind this. The only... There is no previous comparison to, to, to Brexit, but there's one tiny little partial 
uh, example of how complicated these things are, which was when Greenland, part of Denmark, decided it would not be part of the European Union by referendum, etc., and so on. Now, this, although Greenland is a, you know, a vast continent of ice, it had at the time, and I think still has a population of something of the order of 50,000 people, you know, not, not 60 odd million. And it had one and only one issue, fish, okay? It took three years for them to negotiate that. And they ended up having to accept most of the rules of the European Union anyway, without having any say in shaping them. Um, so this is, this is the place to which these people uh, uh, have, have brought Britain. Um, at the same time, continuing to try and, 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 and tell us that um, it's it's a liberation and they will be able to do things that somehow their constrained sovereignty did not enable them to do. Now, this again is a monumental lie. Most of the things that need fixing inside uh, uh, the UK are entirely the prerogative of a sovereign national government. And everybody knows that. Okay? The problems in, you know, about skills, an underskilled workforce, and an extremely complicated, constantly changing education system. Brussels has nothing whatsoever to say on this. Nothing. Nothing. Um, the appalling state of infrastructure in uh, uh, the United Kingdom, which is a, a, a national, or should be, a national embarrassment. Brussels has nothing to say on this, beyond contributing money to try and fix some of it in the poorest regions of, 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 of the country. The almost permanent housing crisis in which this country lives, does that have anything to do with Brussels? No, it has everything to do with outdated planning laws. Um, and, and, and things which a national government, even regional governments there, can fix, but not Brussels. I mean, is it the fault of Brussels, and don't forget what the main charge over the decades has been uh, 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 by the you know, British anti-Europeans. It's been about centralization, okay? This comes from one of the most centralized countries in Europe. Okay? Is it the fault of Brussels that you know, nearly all political, real political power and commercial power is centered in London and the Southeast? I don't think so. Is it the fault of Brussels that be apart from London and the Southeast, and depending on which year, Edinburgh, virtually every region in uh, uh, the United Kingdom is below the average per capita wealth, not of the 28, but of the old EU 15, and has, has been in that position for 15 years. That is not the fault of Brussels. That is the failure of national government. Um, and, <clears throat> and they know it. I just want to um, end by uh, picking up on what Sejal was saying <clears throat> about, you know, the impact on Academia, and the reason I'm doing so is because uh, this month, I mean, whatever you think of these league tables for universities and so on and so forth, there's another matter. But just as as a peg and an, an example, <clears throat> for the first time, Oxford University was judged to be the best university in the world. Okay. Uh, and the UK had three in the top 10, and I think it's five in the top 20, something like that. Um, why was Oxford promoted to, to, to this position? Research, the quality of its research had significantly improved. Why did that happen? It got a lot of money from 
the EU R&D programs, the current one, Horizon, uh, uh, Horizon 2020. 20% of the academics at Oxford are EU nationals. Um, it, uh, what this means, it means so many different things. It means that the areas in, there are some areas, in, not necessarily the ones that the British themselves are always identified, but at which they really do excel. And science is one, and that has an important impact on pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Um, it also means, as, as you pointed out, I forget the figures, but they dis benefit disproportionately and always have from the, the European uh, research budget. What, what is the case now, though? You know, scientific research and the, the, the spin-offs, the, 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 the ventures, the, the products and the medical lines and so on that, that, that it sees, they, it requires several things. I mean, first of all, predictable funding. That's gone out the window now. Uh, um, but even if it were all replaced, you know, euro for euro, pound for pound, or even increased, the point is so many companies have their main research facilities inside uh, the UK because they want to take advantage not just of access to the single market, but the country's excellent science and research basis, which is tied into this, this uh, uh, ability to collaborate at the necessary scale across Europe and the world, and all of which is now uh, up in the air, as indeed are, are so many other things, and I'll end on this. I mean, I think it's things like that that make you feel um, that this is a disaster, but also a betrayal of future generations. Um, I mean, think, for example, of uh, what the Erasmus program has been able to do for all European uh, uh, university students, and which they have come to take as as natural, as, as part of the, it means it makes for them Europe and everything that it has to offer and what Europeans have to offer each other, it makes it their natural habitat. And that has just suddenly been withdrawn um, frequently by people, you know, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but it, it was um, people who don't depend for their future on whether, in other words, people over 65, uh, 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 they don't depend for their future on whether Britain remains inside uh, 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 the European Union, but they voted overwhelmingly against it. Um, I don't know, I mean, my inclination, I would be depriving myself of a vote um, that, that, you know, I, I feel that something like the Erasmus program is worth, you know, a hundred pamphlets extolling the virtues of, 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 of the EU. Um, and when, you know, I can remember my son the day after the vote asking me, you know, what I was so upset about. I tried to explain to him and he said, as kids do, he said, well, it's totally unfair. I didn't have a vote. Um, I said, well, no, son, no, yeah, you're, you're a bit young. But, um, but actually, he, he's got a point. He's much more entitled to a vote than I am because it's about his future. Um, and it is this betrayal of the future which makes this decision, it puts it on another scale. I mean, people compare it to, for example, you know, Suez, 1956, you know, the invasion of Egypt in this conspiracy with, with France and Israel which turned out to be, you know, the last hurrah, the final fling of a sinking European colonialism. But it is, it's far bigger than that. 
we all knew that, and you know, that 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 that, that empire was was finishing. Uh, this isn't finishing, but it. The, but what the British have done might certainly put a nail in the coffin of, of the European uh, uh, project. This was about the future, and now what has been resuscitated in great part as a result of this exercise, you know, across uh, uh, Eastern Europe, you know, th this divide between East and West over these sort of issues, which I think is far, far greater than the divide between North and South over the austerity debate and the so-called bailouts and, and, and the manner of dealing with the financial crisis. That's why, I mean, to finish, I, it's a catastrophe and it's a betrayal. And I really don't see how it can easily be reversed. Thank you. Bye. If we could now um, invite you to take uh, the floor with questions, contributions, uh, stuff that we didn't cover and should have covered, um, uh, and so on. But please, o o over to you. And uh, I, is there a microphone, so another microphone circulating? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'll, 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 uh, my question is yes, just, please. just for, for David. And you mentioned the Good, the good Friday Agreement and the Good Friday Agreement, yeah, yeah. Uh, which which might be the impact of the Brexit in the within within the Irish peace process, as the whole unionist community, both for the Brexit and the nationalist community, is demanding for joining the Republic. Uh, so at the end of the day, is joining Europe. Uh, as Sinn Féin demand, demand recently uh, another referendum and so on, it might deepen, deepen the gap between both communities, the unionist community and the nationalist community. What would happen in the future? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to keep restating that this is so such an unusual event that it's hard to know with any certainty what's going to happen. But, but definitely, I don't see any, I don't see any way around. Let, let's go back to Good Friday. One of the first things that the European Union did was try and tear down that border. Every available, you know, bit of money in budgets, a bit of unspent money here, the budgets, that it was all pulled together and it was pointed at the border in an attempt to break it down and rebuild the links between uh, uh, the, 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 the two parts, to, do, to consider it an artificial border. And obviously, as part of the Good Friday Agreement itself, this vast uh, 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 number of you know, security installations along that border were progressively dismantled. It is now, for all practical purposes, an open border. I mean, it, it doesn't really exist. It's a line on a map. Um, that's going to have to be reinstated. I mean, how, how if, if the British insist on no freedom of movement, how can they not reinstate the only land border that they have with the European Union? If they do insist on no freedom of movement and go outside the customs union, there are going to have to be tariffs. The rules of origin on every good entering uh, uh, the United Kingdom from that border will have to be examined, documented, and so on. That's a border. That's the reinstatement of a border. Now, inside, that, that means that the, the gradual, in my view, the gradual ease with which uh, uh, the island has come together without, let, let's not get starry-eyed about this. I mean, you know, inside the north, you've got, in effect, um, a sort of internal partition by community. You, you don't have this great, 
you know, melting pot of, 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 of the two communities, which, you know, would be nice, but hey, peace is good too. And over, over time, barriers like that may or may not break down, but the barriers between the North and the Republic have, for all practical purposes, disappeared. I mean, you know, there, there are deep-seated political barriers, some of which have a, a, a sectarian basis. Um, you know, there are deep-seated uh, uh, divisions inside the Republic, too, which you can ascribe, you know, to the Civil War of 22-23. We know that. But what, if, if the North is enclosed, no longer attracts the sort of European Union money that it used to get, Maybe uh, 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 it's going to be hard to replace that in, with, with, with uh, funds from, from London, which are already proportionally, you know, really, really quite high. You can see the prospect of, of division. And I just, I don't want to be too long on one person, but just to, to add, though, it's also interesting, as you, as you quite correctly say, I mean, the, the, the nationalist community and the Republican community, in the main, not all of it, voted to, voted to remain. The unionists, not all of them, uh, uh, a, 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 a great part of that, that community voted to leave. But what did unionist leaders say when, to their enormous surprise, the result was leave, Brexit, okay? Because they weren't expecting it either. It just beggars belief, the, the, the lack of seriousness with these people. When the leader of the Democratic Universe, uh, Unionist Party comes out and says, my advice to you, he said, he said, she said, is get yourself an Irish passport, okay? The people who've, you know, been fighting for centuries uh, to, to prove, you know, that they are, you know, they are more British than the British. What is their advice? Get yourself an Irish passport. Amazing. Amazing. Yes, sorry. So if I may also add to the point about the um, Northern Irish uh, peace agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, as it's called, EU law is actually written into that. It's written into the Scotland Act, also um, with respect to devolution in Wales. So this actually makes the legal landscape incredibly complicated. It's one of the reasons that, one of the um, arguments that the People's Challenge is currently using um, to argue for parliamentary approval, for triggering Article 50, that EU law is part of the um, devolution agreements with other parts of the um, uh, UK. Um, uh, as I, I think D David uh, mentioned in his presentation, Northern Ireland, Scotland, overwhelmingly um, uh, voted to remain. Um, Wales voted just to leave, um, apart from that bit in South Wales. But it was really, um, you know, Middle England who voted to leave. Um, and I think that sort of... Um, uh, aspect is, is really significant that the, the UK is hugely divided and these divisions are really thrown into sharp relief by, by the result of the referendum. Um, okay, um, any other questions, please? Sir, you had a question. Yeah. <coughs> Buenas noches. <coughs> Les veo un poco tristes por haber salido de la, por el Brexit, pero les voy a dar una alegría. Ustedes, los ingleses, son europeos de primera. Y nosotros, yo, por ejemplo, soy europeo de segunda, porque a mí nadie me ha, me ha preguntado nunca si quiero estar en Europa o no. A ustedes al menos le han preguntado y ustedes han podido decidir. Yo no he tenido ese derecho democrático, nadie me ha dado, me han metido aquí y aquí estoy. Sin embargo, la señora hablaba de, de recesión. Si le pon, me pongo yo a contar lo que ha supuesto para el Estado español pertenecer a Europa... La pobreza que ha traído, la gente que se ha quedado sin casa, debiendo a los bancos, la recesión total que ha traído es una pérdida de, del PIB igual de un 25 un 30%. Lo que usted me ha contado de Inglaterra, eso es pecata minuta, eso es una, una tontería. Luego, aparte de esto, ustedes han sido de la Comunidad Económica Europea 
pero con privilegios. Nosotros tenemos que comer el menú, pero ustedes han, o sea, pero ustedes han pedido la carta, han podido tener su moneda, que a nosotros, a los demás países de la Comunidad Económica Europea, el no poder devaluar de la moneda nos ha subido peor, era, de, más crisis todavía. Ustedes han tenido la moneda y un montón de privilegios. Entonces, yo soy de los que opino que para tener países con privilegios, mejor fuera. Yo estoy muy contento que ustedes se salgan. Para privilegios, fuera. Iguales, de acuerdo, todos en la Comunidad Económica Europea, pero en Inglaterra y todavía, si el Brexit no hubiera vencido y hubiera quedado rayando, se hubieran pedido más privilegios. Esa era la idea de Cameron, pedir todavía más privilegios. Hombre, por favor. Y luego, de los derechos humanos y de eso también que estaba hablando la señora, ¿derechos humanos? Eso es de risa. Con lo que hemos tenido ahora en las fronteras, que está Hungría construyendo un muro, que se ha pagado a Turquía, un país medio fascista, para que vayan allí los, 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 todos estos, que no les hemos querido ni ver la cara, cuando uno de los tratados europeos dice que tienen derecho a entrar en el país los niños acompañados o solos, las mujeres embarazadas, es decir, un montón de cosas que a eso se les ha mandado a Turquía. Entonces, ¿de qué derechos hablamos humanos? Porque, vamos, es de risa hablar de derechos humanos y hablar de Europa, con lo que hemos visto últimamente. Por eso, no está en tristes. Yo pienso que Inglaterra buscará también su camino y van a estar mejor fuera. Um, okay, first things first, privileges. Um, I think it's actually, you know, on a question as complex as a treaty which uh, involves um, the sharing of some sovereignty, uh, dozens upon dozens of trade agreements and so on and so forth. I mean, as I said in, in, in the course of all, just remark briefly, I really don't think it's uh, the sort of question which is ideally dealt with by a referendum, personally. That is my personal view. I think it's a subject for democracy, certainly, representative democracy. But It, I would therefore say that I think it is a doubtful privilege that, that, that the British have just had, you know, of being offered the chance to be lied to and then to shoot themselves in the foot. I think it's a very doubtful privilege. But I think the essential point is this, that um, there's no reason that I can think of why Spain, if it wanted to, couldn't have a referendum. I mean, it had a referendum on NATO. Um, you know, if, if there was enough popular uh, 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 demand at the time in the 1980s for uh, 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 a referendum on the European Union, but, I mean, you know, it, 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 it might well have happened. But I think sentiment was so overwhelmingly pro-European I mean, like, I'm sure it would have gone about 90% or something. Um, that, you know, I, I imagine at the time the question didn't arise. But I, I mean, it seems to me if you feel strongly about it, then you should campaign to have a referendum. But it seems to me that referendums aren't really flavor of the, 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 the epoch in, 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 in this country at the time. Referendums on anything. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 this... This question of the right to decide is, 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 is not exactly uh, 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 one that, that cent central government is prepared to, to cede. Now, on the question of, uh, you know, the, the, the greater force of the recession as the... the, the The, 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 the greater uh, 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 impact on Spain of the Great Recession after 2007, I can, only, I can only agree. And what I would say in respect to that is, you know, among, among all 
all countries, including the UK, which had to bail out most of its banks, uh, uh, were, were affected. Spain, I think, was affected more because of the relative weight of, of uh, uh, the construction industry in the economy. It's a similar case to, 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 to Ireland. Um, I do think the way in which uh, uh, the European Union, which is to say the Commission, the Central Bank, and the third leg of the Troika, the IMF, which paradoxically turned out to be the most uh, 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 liberal uh, 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 member of the Troika, the way they handled uh, this affair, I think, and it's not just my personal opinion, my newspaper wrote this hundreds of times, uh, um, saying this uh, uh, imposing austerity on an entire nation, making the taxpayer liable essentially for the gambling debts of certain banks in Germany, France, and also in Britain, is not the way forward, okay? We've always argued that. And that is, in remains my position. Now, do I think that this should have been accepted? I do not. I do not. I think it's iniquitous, outrageous, counterproductive, and it is being changed. The policy eventually, I mean, in the face of the evidence, the, the policy has gradually been changed. I mean, in future, banks who make ridiculous uh, 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 loans and investments will be liable to a much greater extent. The bondholders in those banks are going to have to pay up, not the taxpayer. And that's how it should be. So, you know, in essence, I think we're in agreement. Um, the final point, I agree with you on uh, Turkey. The, I think the refugee agreement with Turkey, I'm sorry, I, I do understand what real politic is, really I do, but I think it's shameful. We can go back to that, but I mean, it, it is shameful. It is, uh, you know, quite simply a disgrace, shameful. Um, in practice, those who defend it and say, ah, but it's working, isn't it? Mm, I don't think so. What's working is that they've shut, the Balkan route has been shut. That's what's working, okay? By next month, we will find that this deal with Turkey will unravel. That's my view. But anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. But again, I think we're... We agree on two out of three points. I, uh, can you hear me on this microphone? No? Okay, so I think it doesn't work. Okay, okay sorry. No I problem. Sat on the <laughs> um, thank you for your question. I rather felt that, you know, both of us being staunch remainers here, um, you know, sort of needed, needed such a question, which, you know, really goes to the heart of the European construct, you know, um, which is really the subject today. Um, and, you know, you know, to address the first point about um, referendum and, you know, why not have re referenda in other, or referendums, I can't remember whether it comes from the Greek or Latin, you know, in other parts of Europe. Um, well, I think, actually, this result makes other um, referendums more likely. Um, and, you know, there, there is a referendum taking place on the 2nd of October next week or in a few days in Hungary about essentially a European decision to have um, a small number of refugees, I think it's 1,200 refugees, settled in Hungary. It's tiny. When the second biggest Hungarian city is London. Hungarians are voting about accepting um, around 1,200 refugees. Now, just think about that. Um, you know, where is Europe's compassion? Where is, you know, this, um, you know, reaching out to people clearly in need? Um, and the situation is that, you know, 70% currently, 70 to 80% of people in Hungary are going to vote against accepting um, uh, 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 that number of, 
um, refugees through this referendum. Um, and I think that's, that's tragic, but it certainly does show um, you know, a rejection of, as I said, European institutions and um, an understanding that you reflected very well that the benefits of the European Union haven't been um, equally um, uh, distributed, ha haven't been um, appreciated, haven't been spread across society. I feel very lucky that I've, I've benefited from EU grants, I've benefited from an education which has been funded by the European Union in, in large measure, um, but I think lots of people haven't um, received that. Um, in addition, where there has been um, uh, grants and um, funds received, you know, I come from South Wales, we were talking about other places in the UK, um, which are net beneficiaries um, of uh, EU funding, EU money. Um, those those um, parts of the UK actually voted against remaining, leaving, which I think is really fascinating. You know, you know, counterinstinctive, going against their situation. And why, you know, you know, the messaging of the EU, the appreciation of the EU hasn't hasn't been there. Um, and there are other factors, um, uh, you know, um, in that in that decision. The EU hasn't solved the problems. Um, this, is, this is a crisis of the European Union, not just of the UK, and, and a crisis of globalization um, more, more generally. Um, you know, the UK is the most unequal society, um, the most unequal member state. Um, you know, you have the very richest and also some of the poorest in, in the European Union living in the UK. And um, what was interesting, actually, however, about the result demographically of the EU referendum is that it actually wasn't about the une uneducated, poor, unemployed people who decided, okay, we don't want Europe anymore. Actually, those who voted um, and swung the vote in favor of leaving were actually the white middle classes in South England. Um, and it, it was because the middle classes voted in very, very high numbers that um, you know, most Remainers were actually middle classes, but also so were most Leavers. So um, actually it's not just about class or poverty, it's much more complex about who um, appreciates, who understands, um, who accepts, who wants to stay within the EU and who, who doesn't. Interestingly, um, people of immigrant origin, so non-whites, um, Asians, Muslims, black people, in, they voted largely, uh, largely to remain. Um, in terms of um, your, your last point about um, human rights, I agree with you. Um, where are human rights you know, um, realized meaningfully um, in Europe? Europe has um, a lot to answer for, um, especially in terms of refugees. Um, Yes, we have rights documents, but I agree that you know, many states' um, authorities are falling far short. Um, and you know, there should be accountability. And what Europe gives, both in terms of the EU, through the EU Charter of Rights, but also through um, rights as a result of EU citizenship, notably non-discrimination, um, equal pay, um, as well as the European Convention on Human Rights, you know, there are legal rights that one can rely on and go to court and assert and hold the government to account. And you know, this allows public scrutiny. And in the absence of that, what, what is there? You know, th these are tools that um, can be used and are used um, and have been used expansively by um, individuals, by citizens and non-citizens um, within Europe. Um, to, um, to assert their rights. So I, I agree with you, there, there is a crisis. And in that, in that respect, I, I'd actually like to quote um, High Commissioner Zaid, um, the current UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, who has been talking about these um, uh, threads in our tapestry, um, which have been unraveling, our world is unraveling, he said. Um, and he notes populists and demagogues who have emerged in Europe, but also in the US, as um, uh, David in, um, uh, referred to himself. Um, Gert Wilders, Viktor Orban in Hungary, 
in Slovakia, in uh, the Czech Republic, Mar um, Madame Le Pen in France, and Nigel Farage in the UK. And he said that all these individuals seek in varying degrees to recover a past, halcyon, and so pure in form, where sunlit fields are settled by peoples united by ethnicity or religion, living peacefully in isolation, pilots of their own fate, free from crime, foreign influence and war, a past that most certainly, in reality, did not exist anywhere ever. Europe's past, as we all know, was for centuries anything but that. The proposition of recovering a supposedly perfect past is fiction. Its merchants are cheats, clever cheats, as we see from the result of the EU referendum. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> That's it. Okay, so um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think um, I will try to add a little bit more to this debate as I'm coming from Ukraine. So being from a non-EU country, um, I very much understand how is it to be in EU and uh, the understanding of the borders, the trade issues, the economic issues, the political issues, etc. And uh, at the same time, so I, I I'm totally understand the situation and the and then um, uh, the against the Brexit and the, 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 the what happened in the UK in, uh, in summer and how it's going to impact the country as inside the country as well as Europe-wise and continentally-wise. At the same time as uh, it was mentioned, whether it's catast catastrophe and a betrayal, I would say it's more betrayal by the generation rather than catastrophe. I understand it is a very uh, impactful event and it's going to affect as well as economics, as well as the politics, but it's not a catastrophe. And um, basically being an economist and b b partially having a little bit to, to do with the politics, if we look on the, all the Eastern European trends, what's happening in East uh, Europe with the relationships between Ukraine and Russia and uh, the Crimea, yes, it impacts uh, the economic degradation. There is a uh, um, economic impact that uh, every day, uh, like people will face daily. But in the long term, it's going to be balanced. Uh, in the long term, um, the politics will stay politics. The populism uh, stays as it is. Um, the, in terms of the human rights, in terms of the rights of um, um, of the citizens, you know, whether it goes really to make a change. Politics do their politic things, and the society. Um, does, is, is getting affected by that. And in this sense, the business is going to um, continue trying to survive as they can. Uh, this is the example of also, for example, the, um, uh, the barriers, which is uh, play, or the, um, um, the barriers which are placed for Russia. Uh, many companies cannot sell. They have uh, um, clearly an um, they see the uh, impact on, uh, from uh, from uh, from their like political um, decisions, but at the same time, business still trades with uh, with uh, companies in in Russia. The same hap was going to happen uh, between UK and Spain. If we can see, for example, there's going to be events that facilitate the small businesses to come, even despite all the extra paperwork, as you said, um, um, that they will have to do. Uh, and uh, I think that the, the, the partial, the reason which is also the happening now is, act, is actually about the values that people are now seeing in terms of the politicians that 
they do not trust or they do not see the value of the political systems, whether it is in Ukraine, whether it's in European Union, whether it's in Spain or UK, the politicians are promoting their clear ideas. And then, as you say, the BBC, the media can easily manipulate the, the idea. So we are even are dependent from all this idea. We cannot even clearly, despite all the education, sometimes set a clear understanding whether it's right or wrong. And uh, as you clearly said, the, the middle class in UK has voted. And I'm, I'm sure they know all the, the drawbacks of the, uh, of the Brexit. Probably not. But if they know, they probably deliberately did it, not because of economic issues, but because of some other either political or social or deeper. So I, I think that all the processes that, or many of the processes that are happening within European uh, states are due to certain values which are in the society and has been brought via um, either economic or rather by media and political movements that are happening and spread. Um, where media resources are other um, tools. In the four, um, I would like to know also your opinion of how we as a young generation, like, uh, well, not that young, but still, the generation that is kind of going to influence and uh, leave and impact this, uh, this world in the next decades, how should, uh, what are the, the, how should we see the, how should we impact, what should we do, or kind of, to, to exclude these cases or make, you know, that there's, uh, that the people do know kind of a tr get, get the true information or that the politicians are, do not anyone negotiate all the international organizations or UN that claims that they're so bad in the Syria the cases that the hospitals have been being destroyed. Nothing is still taking place as an impact. And here I said another, issue of, it is a horrible event that took uh, uh, of the Brexit, but it's not, uh, it is a single case in terms of European Union, but it's not a single case in terms of globally wise, politically wise, and economically wise that ha takes place. So I would really like to know your kind of views on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, I tend to agree with David about it was a catastrophe, in my, in my mind, too. Um, I mean, the day after the vote at my institution, we had class photographs. Um, I'm quite transparent. Not only do I promote transparency and freedom of information, but I'm actually quite transparent, too. Um, and the students came up to me and gave me their condolences, literally, right? So the catastrophic impact was not just felt by me, but by others around me, non-Brits, um, many from the EU, many from Eastern Europe, but also elsewhere. Um, so no, I, I, I do agree with the use of that term, but I think your essential question is how to make a difference, how do young people make a difference um, in a situation where you have, as uh, uh, people have said, populists and demagogues, um, and that resistance at the political level, misinformation, and even if there is correct information given by experts, a rejection of it, and um, you know the, the domination of certain um, groups um, in uh, you know the media, for example, and how to make an impact. Well, um, and, and you know all, all the while in, in countries like Hungary, um, where <laughs> Viktor Orban uh, several years ago now in 2014 expressly said that Russia presents a new model of illiberal democracy that we should look to, right? So I'm very glad you um, referred to Russia. And the person who was cheering loudest, if we were grieving about the result, the person who was cheering loudest was Vladimir Putin on the 24th, um, with you know, the implications that Brexit has for, for the um, future of the EU, potentially. Um, but my answer to that question about how to make a difference is um, about really two things. First of all, um, organize and civil society. Yes, one can you know, enter politics, educate oneself, try and make a difference that way. But actually, civil society um, at the local level, at the grassroots, um, through networks, um, uh, the national level and beyond, actually, I really strongly believe can make a difference. 
Um, and you see that already in um, uh, you know, certain parts of Central and Eastern Europe, including in Hungary. I mean, they really have shone the spotlight on issues like um, uh, uh, media laws in, in, in Hungary, which have really you know, constrained the power of independent media. Um, and, and related to civil society is, is the media and the importance of um, investigative journalism, independent investigative journalism, which is now currently under um, um, significant threat, I think really needs to be in re reinforced, not just because of journalists' rights, not just because of the freedom of the media, but for democratic values and the values of um, liberal democracy more generally. Um, and related to that, um, the value of social media really has to be pondered and considered. Um, a few weeks ago, um, The Economist had a special issue on post-truth um, democracy or post-fact society. Um, front and cover. And it was, the, the, the um, longer opinion piece was very critical of the role that social media has played in shaping, consolidating, um, assuring people of, of their opinions. Um, you know, and social media companies, these giants who exercise such power now, I'm talking about Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, um, you know, what, what is their role and responsibility? I'm not for one second suggesting that there should be you know, um, controls on, on the media. Um, but I am suggesting that we really need to think about things like what um, um, Emily Bell um, at uh, Columbia University has referred to as algorithmic accountability in terms of, you know, when you go on um, Facebook, for example, you see the posts that Facebook thinks you should see, right? Um, and, you know, when you have situations like just a few weeks ago, um, which really, um, highlighted the editorial power of Facebook when the photograph of um, the girl in Vietnam who has um, suffered a, a napalm attack running away was taken down by Facebook. Just, you know, highlights, and, and, and then subsequently Facebook put it back on. You know, just shows that, you know, Facebook does have an editorial power. And, um, and I think going forward, we really need to, really need to think about that. So, so my answer to that is, like, you know, focusing on um, social media as a tool um, in terms of organizing, um, giving voice to um, vulnerable groups, minorities, voices that aren't heard because of um, other voices clamoring um, in um, public spaces. You know, do get a position, do get a voice in, in social media, but, but those need to be sort of um, understood within the context of, of this um, still... Um, uh, you know, emerging digital space which we haven't really understood and a kind of old frameworks of regulation and, um, and um, thinking about responsibilities of um, these organizations needs, needs to be um, thought about much more. Uh, um, but final point is that yes, I, I do agree with you. It is a huge betrayal of um, people like um, David Sun, you know, those young people who did manage to vote, 18-year-olds, there was an argument that 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds should also vote, but it was older people. Now, older people, there's an interesting um, dynamic there too, which is that the Leave campaign promised that the 350 million pounds that are saved every week um, from um, giving to the EU would be diverted to the National Health Service. Now, if you're an older person and uh, the um, life expectancy, including for, especially for women, I think, has gone down over recent years in the UK, um, you know, that is a really strong argument that, you know, that money's going to be saved and, you know, that means that the NHS is going to be, you know, um, uh, strengthened. You know, that dynamic also, I think, perhaps played a role. You know, um, many academics ironically, are, going, are having a field day at the moment, social geographists, political scientists, and this um, unpacking the um, uh, post-mortem of the EU referendum is going to go on for much, a long time. Um, but, um, but certainly the, the um, older generation were, were part of the reason why the UK voted to leave. And yeah, it's a betrayal um, of those that really will experience um, the challenges that Brexit will deliver if 
it does um, take place. I, rem I, I remain hopeful with that like chink of light that uh, you know, parliamentary approval could, um, or, or, or the, the, the acceptance that parliamentary approval is necessary could mean that um, parliament might stop it. But there is a great political imperative, which is actually unfortunately growing through the reiteration of Brexit um, as if it has already happened and is not being helped by the lack of transparency of the government at the moment. I, <clears throat> I agree with everything that Sir George has just said and I don't want to go and, and, and repeat it all, but just picking up on a, a, a couple of things to, to add to them. Um, the question of journalists' rights, I, I don't really think of them as journalists' rights, I think of them as citizens' rights. Um, they're your rights, actually. It's your right to have journalists in a position where they place in your hands accurate information and analysis which help you to make informed um, decisions or, or, or just to carve out areas of, 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 of interest. Um, so, I mean, it's a much broader issue than, you know, uh, journalists. Secondly, it, it, it is very important. This whole question of um, there are so many strands to the advent of social media, the digital revolution, de da de da. But um, one of which is this tendency for um, opinion to self-reinforce and ghettoize the opposite, frequently, of what you know internet evangelists tell us the phenomenon is all about. Um, but I'm, let, let's not go too far into that. The, 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 but there is, in terms of the survival of journalism, there is a huge issue here. I mean, personally, I believe that, so, uh, that, that journalism will survive. But an awful lot of media organizations are not going to survive. Um, therefore, a new business model somehow has to be developed. And I suspect the inspiration for that is not going to come from so much from within the media. I mean, an organization like mine, which is a little bit more niche, so as the economist and so on, they can survive. Um, diff it's difficult, but yeah. But more general news, um, at a time, I mean, what has happened over the past year is probably the definitive advertising recession in modern history. Um, it's literally, to coin a cliche, fallen off a cliff. It's just print advertising has disappeared. Digital, online advertising, more than 70%, I forget the exact figure, has gone to two sources, Google and uh, 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 Facebook. You know, everybody thinks The Guardian is a great online success, okay? It is losing approximately two million pounds a week. Um, that cannot go on indefinitely. Even though they have a, they have a big cushion from a, a different sort of activity, a, a motor train magazine business which they sold. So they can survive with these losses for, I, I don't know what it be, eight, ten years. But they thought they could survive for much longer and the number of years is coming down. I mean, just in America, which is considered a huge and pioneering success for the Guardian, the loss is 16 million uh, uh, pounds. I mean, it, it's, it's a fairly uh, uh, indicative loss. You know, there has to be thinking all round about this. I mean, there was an interview the other day by the head of the Axel Springer organization in Germany who pointed out that short of some sort of agreement between media and social media giants, then I forget in how many years he said there would be no more media. Uh, um, I mean, th these are, you know, discount 50% for, you know, 
alarmism or he's talking his own book or whatever. But, he, it, but this is real. This is real. I mean, another issue, sorry, because it's been mentioned, I don't think we can talk about it enough, is the need to just be so aware of the twists and turns and tricks and the legitimization of illiberal democracy as a model. Um, this is a very, very serious threat. And it's, it's becoming a new vogue inside the, the, the frontiers of the European Union, cheered on, as you pointed out, by uh, you know, uh, uh, men of such impeccable liberal convictions such as Vladimir Putin and Tayyip Erdogan. Um, it's, this is very, very, very serious indeed, I think. And it's not, it's not just the Visegrad, the Eastern European ones, it's Austria. It's, it's the Le Pen phenomenon, the Farage phenomenon, the uh, alternative for, for Deutschland uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, within which is harbored uh, 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 some you know, very nasty specimens of, of the fascist right, um, and so on. I mean, it, it's very serious indeed. But anyway, we have time for some more questions. Um, more interventions. Hello. Um, so it's a more of an extension, but um, on the subject of young people, young people don't generally tend to vote in general elections because the policies aren't directed towards them because they don't vote. So it's a, it's a cycle. However, with Brexit, it really was, as you point out with your son, something that would affect the young for far longer and far greater than the elderly or the older. <laughs> Um, and they did, they voted more than they ever have before and were overwhelmed. The under 18s, 16 to 18s were not allowed to vote as they were in Scotland. Why would they ever vote again? What, how can they ever be engaged in politics and change anything if they can't change something that's so important to them? And my other question, I suppose, is to what extent was the media responsible for this catastrophe? I believe it's a catastrophe. And what regulations should be put into place to ensure that it's as factual as it should be? Um, that, that's, that's a great question. You know, if, if you know, 75% of young people, 18 to 24 year olds voted to remain and their vote was ignored or, you know, not accepted by, by the, um, res results or the, or the majority, then, you know, what, what is there for the future? Um, I don't think we have a choice. I think that's ultimately um, the position. I think it is, it is such a catastrophe that we cannot rest on our laurels. Um, I, I don't fall into that category anymore. Um, I wish I did. But, you know, I, I think if there's a time to engage, it's now. You know, because at this moment, you know, you know whether it's, you know, through civil society, through, um, you know, organising at a community level, putting pressure on MPs, you know, getting together like this crowd crowdfunded group, the People's Challenge. You know, um, you know, I think there are venues and possibilities and avenues for for scrutiny and, um, you know, continuing to make sure that. Um, the, the band of um, Etonians who are in charge now, um, you know, don't have an untrammeled way to hard Brexit. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think young people still have, have ways. In terms of the media, um, so we've referred to The Economist and um, Guardian and the Financial Times, but the biggest selling newspaper is the Daily Mail. Oh, no, it's, it's the second biggest. I think the first is the Sun, the second is the Daily Mail, but the biggest online news site in the world is the Daily Mail, mm. right? And this had a huge impact. What to do about it? That word regulation. So as a freedom of expression um, advocate, um, instinctively, my response to, the, you know, the idea of regulation is um, uh, self-regulation. That should be... 
the policy. Now, in the UK, after um, kind of um, an overhaul, a sort of self um, um, uh, looking at the system of press regulation after the news of the world uh, crisis a few years ago, there's this new um, body called um, IPSO. And um, just before I came here, I, I actually thought about the question that you put and um, uh, just pulled off you know, the kinds of um, comments, some of which, uh, or, or an example of which David referred to in terms of what, what it produced. So um, Daily Mail, for example, had comments like, migration has created 900 no-go areas in the EU. That's exactly what Viktor Orban and his ilk have honed in on, saying that London has no-go areas, something that um, Evan, Evan Davis on um, Newsnight was challenging um, the um, Prime Minister of Hungary spokesman on just a few nights ago. And they came up with the tide of terror, migrant wave is a threat, admits EU border agency. These, these are all lies, by the way, essentially. Um, eight pounds is all it costs migrants to bribe Turkish frontier guards to let them into the uh, um, EU. And the worst one in my mind is from another tabloid, Brexit or die and be raped. So this is the sort of messaging of some of the sort of biggest selling media. And yeah, what, I mean, what to do about that? You know, what is the, what is the counter response? Um, 20,000 migrants ready to sneak into Britain, and those kinds of words, um, you know, highly sort of incendiary almost. You know, the idea of swarming refugees also, which the government at the highest level, not the media, the government um, have, um, have used. So, you know, there's no correction, there's no apology, there's no um, response to that, but I think there needs to be. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the, the media has a, has a lot to answer for, but that doesn't mean um, we should have um, you know, I think heightened regulation, I think at the moment, um, you know, with the new um, Royal Charter, I think that is sufficient, but what there needs to be is much more critical um, media um, and louder voices at the political level which reject this sort of thing. I mean, on social media you have people like um, an MEP from North London, Estella Creasy, calling out, uh, uh, you know, such, such issues. Um, raised in um, the tabloid press, but um, but I think you know I mean where is Theresa May talking about racism? You know you have wh why do we have to rely on the Archbishop of Canterbury? You know um, so yeah I think the counter messaging hasn't been there enough, and there hasn't been enough of a positive case made for why to stay in the value of staying in the European Union. Um, including, you know, related to rights and citizenship rights, but also, you know, at a kind of almost spiritual level. What, why is it better to do things together? What is the common identity that we have? You know, I, just walking through this stunning museum, I had the great sense that this, you know, this means so much to me, you know, as much as, you know, St. David's uh, in the west of Wales. Um, so, you know, thinking of identity as being um, not zero sum, Right, you know, I can be, um, you know, by blood and by ethnicity, but you know, in terms of what I, much of what I eat, but not only, um, Gujarati. I can be from South Wales. I speak Italian. I live in Hungary. Educated in, you know, so it's it's multiple. Multiple identities are okay. We should celebrate them, and um, I think that hasn't been really done um, as much as it should be in Europe. In in the United States, there's much more of an idea of a melting pot, right? But in, in, in the EU, um, there hasn't been that really successfully done. Yeah. Again, I couldn't agree more. But, um, on, on media, I mean, particularly, uh, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier in my presentation the BBC and how I think, um, I think they, their interpretation of, of the duty to present uh, balanced news information and analysis actually amounts to an error of a basic error of judgment um, but how do you get into that position it seems to me the years and years there are two principal factors one um, I think it begins mostly with the, the Murdoch press which is then overtaken by the Daily Mail as the principal, uh, the, 
the principal manufacturer of social alarm uh, in, in, in the country. I mean, it's not the Daily Mail, particularly over migration, but not only over vaccinations, you know, and, and things, but it's, um, it, it paints a totally unreal world and then panders to the people who use that interpretation for, for, for political ends. To my mind, it's not a newspaper. It's a genuine social problem, the Daily Mail. Uh, uh, um, and is part of, it, it's an important part of the reason. But these, the Murdoch Press, the Mail and so on, it, that's, it, it's plus politicians who present uh, 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 Brussels as the source of all evils, um, whereas many of those evils, Brussels has nothing to do with, as, 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 as I pointed out earlier, that who, who furthermore actually lie or misrepresent what they do in Brussels. They go into council meetings, they argue for a certain position, they vote in a certain way if it comes to a vote, um, and then often they go out and brief the press they tell them a pack of lies. How about they fought the good fight? They, you know, but then they were overwhelmed. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 some of it is pure fiction. Um, so those two combined things, um, a sort of mendacious tabloid press, Murdoch Mail, uh, politicians who uh, uh, deliberately misrepresent Brussels in order to use it as, as a, 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 a scapegoat for, 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 for everything that's going wrong in their lives, that tends gradually to push an organism, an institution like the BBC, which ultimately is dependent on agreements, taxation agreements, the license fee and so on, which will be uh, in, in the political domain. It pushes the BBC onto the defensive. I've said that there are three areas in which it is identifiably, in my view, lost its nerve over the past two decades. European Union, Israel-Palestine, and climate change. I mean, uh, um, this sort of stuff should be part of the public debate. Uh, um, this is a public institution. Um, I'm not sure what you can do about the mail, but you can definitely do something about the BBC. I mean, one can. As collective citizens, we should be able to do so by raising this sort of stuff. I mean, you know, it's not beyond the wit of man. I mean, I, I have the draft of a report on uh, how the media covered the referendum by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford in my bag. I've only skimmed it. That will be, I think, a quite important report as a contributor to this debate and so on. Um, some last reflections before we break. Okay, so, um, well, thanks very much for your questions. Um, it was, um, you know, great to hear them and um, to see that people here in San Sebastian are interested um, and realize the significance of this, um, whether or not you think it's a catastrophe or not. Um, it certainly had... Um, you know, massive implications in terms of um, the UK, but also in terms of the U EU as a global presence in the world um, and its possibilities for shaping and reshaping um, the continent, but also the EU's role, um, you know, externally is, is huge. Um, so um, I think my final words, words are really about, you know, if there's a time to engage, it really is now. And, and there are opportunities and venues and that we should not rest on our laurels because the alternative is darkness. You know, we cannot leave it up to um, the populists and demagogues, as um, the High Commissioner Zayed says, um, about you know, individuals you know, across Europe and, and elsewhere that you know, we, need, we need to ensure that, for example, um, Trump doesn't get elected, right? Um, you know, th those of us who has, have the opportunity as American citizens, who, and I know there are some in this room, um, you know, 
you know, at, at a very basic level, we need to be um, much more sort of a vigilant, eternal vigilance, um, not giving up, um, because the alternative um, is unthinkable. Um, just the, 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 these questions, engagement, and earlier you mentioned transparency. Let, let me just end by just one anecdote, which is true. Um, um, everything one should be against. It's, it concerns somebody uh, who was who is now a minister, um, but then, not so very long ago, was going to be interviewed by the constituency party of the Conservative Party in a safe Conservative seat. So if they said, right, you're our man, you're our candidate, because uh, he, he was a man, um, you know, he would almost impossible to lose. Okay, so those are the stakes. Now, the day before the interview, he happens to come looking for somebody who happened to be in my office at, in London at the time. And this individual used to work as uh, uh, in uh, what is called a conservative central office. In other words, he's part of the, the apparat and the, the thinking of uh, 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 the party. By thinking, I use the term loosely, but um, anyway, the, and he said that the prospective candidate asks uh, the other chap, he said, he said, listen, I'm going, I'm going to be interviewed and said, what shall I tell them about the European Union? And the former conservative uh, uh, official just looks at him like that. He says, you lie. You lie. Otherwise, you know, I know what your opinions are on Europe. I know what they are. You lie. Otherwise, they simply won't choose you. Okay? Now, how many people, I wonder, have lied about uh, uh, all this? I mean, Boris Johnson certainly lied. Um, I mean, he is not actually anti-European. I, I know this. I have numerous conversations with him. Lots of people know it. Uh, um, but for the purposes of his political ambition, that's not a serviceable position. So, you know, there's a sense in which a, a, a task of actually trying to make it easier for people entering political life not to lie about what they think would be such a massive improvement. Uh, 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 on, on, on what we currently have. Um, that's my final reflection, along with many thanks for a very, very stimulating conversation and for taking the time to come along and uh, listen to this not altogether happy debate. But anyway, there we are. Thank you. Thank you.